Okay, thank you very much. Um, my name is Richard Hickman. I'm a director in Harbourvest Global Private Equity. I look after the day-to-day -day operations of HVPE, which is an investment company listed in London. Uh, we're in the FTSE 250. Our specialism is investing into private companies. So my presentation will focus firstly on why would you want to do that, and secondly on why HVP is the best route uh, to access that investment. Now, some of the companies that HVP has backed in its portfolio over time uh, are shown on the, on the screen here. Um, these are names that I'm sure you're all very familiar with. Uh, very, very successful venture investments that came, the majority came out of the US from the, from the top venture capital houses. Now, these companies are not usually accessible to retail investors. Uh, they're private companies, they're held by a very small group of venture capital specialists for a long time during their early stage development. And that is when the, the money is made, frankly. Uh, by the time these companies IPO, um, then yes, there are some success stories, but a lot of the value has already been created and it's been uh, effectively enjoyed by the early stage investors. And what I'm presenting here today is a way to, to join those early stage investors in, in effectively a pooled vehicle that is investing right from the word go uh, into some of these companies. Um, the statements on the slide here, the, the universe of private companies globally is, is probably, and we don't have exact figures, but probably around 10 times the size of the listed market. If you look at the US only, 86% uh, of uh, companies with more than 500 employees are privately held. So those are companies that the majority of, of everyday investors cannot access. Um, the returns from private companies over the long run are proven to be superior to those in the listed markets. So if you look at the median US private equity fund over 20 years, compare that to the S&P 500, so the equivalent in the US, um, you'll find that the average annual growth rate in the private equity fund has been 16% on an annualized basis. That compares to 9% annualized for, as a total return for the S&P 500. So that's the sort of opportunity that is available investing into private companies. <clears throat> now, can I ask a, a quick question of the audience? Who has actually heard of private equity? Okay. So I thought the majority have, but there are still some people who haven't heard of the asset class altogether, and that's an important point. Uh, private equity has been around for 35 years. Um, it's, it's considered now uh, amongst alternative, alternative investments as a mainstream option. Um, in the charts here, I show that clearly over, over the long run, if you look at the 20-year chart in the, in the top left, private equity has outperformed real estate infrastructure, the MSCI world. We don't have figures for hedge funds going back that far. Even in the shorter term, you can see that private equity is in the lead versus the majority of these alternative assets. And so there's a very strong argument for invest investing in the asset class. It is underserved in terms of publicity and in terms of um, investor awareness. Uh, it's it's a, a large industry, but by, by no means is it mature to the, to the same extent that listed markets are. It still makes up a very small percentage of the investment universe. So. Um, when you're looking at private equity, just bear in mind it, there, are, there is opportunity here. <clears throat> and the chart that's just appeared on the right there is um, a little bit of a complex point, but one that it's important to make, I think, with private equity, because um, in any investment there's an element of market timing, as, as one of the questions earlier was, was alluding to. Uh, there are opportunities to get into listed companies when they're perhaps trading below where they should be. Um, and a lot of investors think that perhaps we should try to do the same in private equity funds. The issue there, though, is that we commit in private equity funds for a period of 10 years. We're locking up our capital with a manager over that sort of length of time. So it's not very easy to trade in and out of private equity as and when you, you may judge the opportunity to be greater or lesser. Um, so what we did was analyze the returns in the funds that HVPE, the company I represent, invests in. And we looked back over 20 years at each individual vintage year. So we, we refer to vintage years as being, so 2014 would be a vintage year in private equity. That's, that's when those investments were made. And if you'd been smart enough to avoid 
the worst three vintage years over the last 20, then your return would have gone from a 1.8 times capital cost to a 1.9 times capital cost. So you would have benefited clearly from avoiding the worst three years. If you'd avoided by accident the, the best three years, your return would have fallen from 1.8 to, to just over 1.6 times. So the actual loss would have been greater than the gain you could have made. So with that evidence, it's very clear that just committing on an annual basis, investing consistently over time, is actually the best way to deliver value in private equity. And that's what HVPE does. So if you're investing in HVPE, which is a listed company, you buy the shares, we manage all this on your behalf. We're investing every year into private equity funds across buyouts and venture capital to ensure that we maximize returns over the long run. Now, specializing now in just HVP, focusing on the company and the opportunity. This is um, a very brief fact sheet. There's a lot more data available on the website. But just to pull out some of the key stats, this is a, a significant fund. We're the fourth largest listed private equity fund in London by uh, market capitalization. We're a £730 million fund. <clears throat> the NAV, the value of the underlying assets, is actually in excess of a billion pounds. So we're trading at a discount to the value of these private equity fund assets that we hold. Um, the discount today, 31%, is very high for, a, for an investment company. Um, it's a little high even for a private equity investment company, and, and there are reasons for that which I'll, I'll explain. <clears throat> but if you look at the key performance figures, NAV growth over five years in US dollars, over 100%. So we've doubled the NAV in, in, um, sorry, in, in, in sterling, 106%. The share price growth is a little bit lower than that, hence the, the opening up of the discount. But if you look at the annualized NAV growth, the annualized return on the, the underlying portfolio, over the period since 2007 when we listed, we've generated 12.3% annualized growth in sterling. Now, if you remember the situation in December 2007, in all asset markets, prices were very high, valuations were high, uh, we listed um, unfortunately, right at the wrong time, just before the financial crisis hit. Um, so we're measuring ourselves from a very high bar to start with and still having delivered that sort of return. Uh, one key point to mention at the bottom of the slide, it's, it's a little bit of a, a niche interest perhaps, but the liquidity available in the fund, um, if you're concerned about being able to get in and out of the investment, uh, we, we typically see around half a million pounds a day of, of share trading. So there, there's ample liquidity in, in the shares. Now, a view of the portfolio at a high level. Um, we have a very diversified portfolio. We have more, ultimately more than 6,900 individual underlying company investments, all private companies with some, some that have gone public as part of the exit process, but the majority are private. And so within that, uh, the top 100 companies are around a third of NEV. So although we have a very diversified portfolio, we still have significant individual company exposures. The largest company exposure is just over 1.4% of, of NEV. <clears throat> Two thirds of the fund is in buyouts. Uh, that, uh, for those who are not familiar with private equity, is where the private equity fund takes a controlling stake in the, in the business that it's, that it's uh, investing in. So it buys more than 50% of the business and the manager runs that, that investment effectively, the, the private equity fund owns the business. Um, a third of the portfolio is venture capital and growth equity. So the venture capital funds like Index Ventures, Axel Partners, very well known in the US, less well known perhaps over here. Uh, they are backing very early stage companies in some cases. The majority of our uh, venture capital exposure is is at the revenue generating stage. We're not normally investing pre-revenue. Uh, some of it will be pre-profit, pre um, but it's, it's biased towards the kind of later stage growth end of venture. <clears throat> By geography, we're a majority in the US, partly as a function of the private equity industry being heavily US biased, um, and also because we're a US based manager. But frankly, that strategy has proven very successful in recent years as the US has delivered stronger returns than any other geographic region. And then by strategy, um, a little bit more difficult to explain, but Harbourvest invests in private equity in three different ways. It backs private equity funds when they are first raised, so that's what we call primary investing. It 
purchases funds on the secondary market. So you may have a fund that's four or five years old with 10 investors, two investors decide to sell, we can go in and, and buy those stakes. Uh, and what we call direct is Harbourvest investing into operating companies themselves alongside a manager. So those are the three types of investing we do. Harbourvest is one of the very few firms that looks across all three of those strategies at the same time. And there are advantages to doing so. We have very strong information flows. We have access to a very large pool of potential investments. And when we're making, for example, a secondary purchase, we often have exposure to some of those assets already via our primary investing business. So it gives us an advantage. We have much more information than some of our peers do. This is the track record since the IPO of, of the listed vehicle. Um, December 2007, you can see we started off at actually $10 a share, quickly bounced on the, the IPO. Um, we IPO'd and the manager, Harbourvest, took all the costs of the listing on, on board itself, so shareholders didn't pay any of the costs. Started off at $10 a share with, with $10 of assets. The green line at the top, you can see, is the NAV per share, so that's the real value of the investments over time. Um, compound growth of 6.5% in dollars, 12.3% in sterling. The dark blue line is our benchmark, the MSCI All Company World Index. That's the closest we can get to a global comparison to the kind of activities that we engage in. So this is a very diverse index. Uh, we invest globally, the index is global. That's the, the closest benchmark we can have. And our target is to outperform that index by 500 basis points annualized. And you can see we've got both measured in dollars, 6.5% versus 2.9% since inception, we are not too far off our target. <clears throat> the dotted green line is the share price. So you can see there's a disconnect between the solid green line, which is the, the assets, and the dotted green line, which is the share price. And that is the opportunity. Everyone's eye will immediately be drawn to the vertical line <laughs> in 2009. Um, we originally listed in Euronext in Amsterdam, and there was very little liquidity in that market post-IPO. Um, so we, as you can see, there's a kind of horizontal line just before we, before we drop. Um, the financial crisis had already begun, but there was very little trading in the shares. So one of the analysts joked that we were the wily coyote of listed private equity at that point. We'd just gone off the cliff, but we hadn't started falling. Um, and then we saw a significant trade that, that took us down uh, to a very wide discount to NAV of, of more than 60%. Since that time, you can see we've started to recover from that, but I think the financial crisis kind of scarred a lot of investors who had invested in listed private equity. Um, one or two of our peers did experience difficulties with balance sheets uh, and had to um, you know, perform emergency rights issues or they had to um, renegotiate commitments. So there were issues around that time that have put people off for a number of years. Um, HVPE though was not affected by those those factors. I mean, we, we managed the balance sheet very prudently right through the crisis. We had no reason to, to um, go to investors for capital. Um, and so we were kind of unfairly thrown out with a bathwater type of situation. A classic example of a, of a very high quality business being sold off indiscriminately alongside others. Now, how have we performed versus our peers? There are other listed private equity funds available. Um, they're all, these are all listed. Um, we have typically, I mean, we compare ourselves to around 10 peers in terms of size and, and uh, operations. They're not a perfect overlap. They're, they're all very different structures uh, in one way or another. But the, the one-year return doesn't tell you very much, but we're roughly in the middle of the table. This is a long-term investment. And the longer the period you look at, the better our performance relative to our peers. So you can see the three years on the top right. Um, we're, we're moving str a little bit up the table there. Five years, we're second only to Electra, which is a, a direct investor. They have a, a small portfolio of, of private companies. Um, and over the eight and a half years since our IPO, we're actually the top performer. <clears throat> and this is really, this is what our business is about. It's a long-term investment. It's steady. We've kept to the original strategy of fund of funds investing, primary, secondary, direct, venture and buyout. Uh, and that's yielded very strong growth over time. <clears throat> and now the value point. Um, and this is an opportunity because up until the EU referendum, we traded at a 20% discount to NAV. 
Our shares trade in sterling, but our NAV is denominated in US dollars. Almost all of our portfolio is outside the UK, 95% outside the UK. And 98% of the portfolio is in non-sterling currencies because the majority of European funds are in euros. So we um, saw our discount to NAV go from 20% to 30% overnight. And that was purely because the NAV in dollars translated into sterling suddenly increased because of the, the FX change. So our share price actually didn't fall particularly hard, even on the day of the referendum. Um, we saw about a 3% fall. But now it's actually back above where it was before the referendum. But our discount, because it's, it's not quite as visible as some of the other funds because of that difference in the shares versus the NAV, has remained at, at the 30% level. So that potentially is an opportunity for, uh, in terms of a, a technical factor. You can see that there's quite a wide range of discounts in listed private equity. 3i Group is uh, the largest listed private equity business uh, in London. That trades on a 15% premium to any of these. You're paying more for the, for the company than, than its assets are worth at the moment. And then you have a, a range going down to Oldsmere at 40%. There are some others that are not really peers that trade at 50 plus percent discounts. <clears throat> a shareholder profile, this is um, something specific to our fund because we're trying to diversify the shareholder base. We think that's part of the, the key to improving liquidity and to uh, narrowing the discount, which is very much a focus of ours at the moment. So we've seen um, our original IPO holders, which were pre predominantly US institutions, have been selling down over time. We started off... Um, in September 2015, uh, when we first moved to the main market in London, having been on the specialist funds market prior to that, we started uh, on the main market with a 48% 48, 48 US shareholding. That has fallen to 37% as of today. You can see we've generated significant buying from the likes of the Prudential in the UK, who started an alternatives fund program. Um, We've seen index funds come in. We joined the FTSE 250 index in December 2015. So we're a relatively new entrant into that fund. If you have a FTSE 250 or all share tracker, you will already own HVPE. Um, and we've seen retail investors, of course, uh, the investors I'm here to speak to tonight, have, have already purchased 1% of the company, which is you know, 10, million, 10 million pounds of assets. Um, so we're, we're really seeing quite a lot of interest being generated already. Now, these, uh, this slide and the following two, I'll skip over fairly quickly. I'm, I'm running out of time. But I wanted to give some examples, some hard examples of actually what you're buying, because it is a very diversified portfolio. Um, but there are some nice examples of some of the um, larger exposures that you probably will have heard of. So if you know anything about private equity, you will have heard of Blackstone Group, you will have heard of KKR, you will have heard of um, DCM, perhaps even Index as a venture name. Uh, they're all the top names. It's very difficult for a new investor to access those funds. Even if you have $100 million and you want to invest in Index's next fund, the chances are you won't be able to. It's oversubscribed because they've performed so well that they can turn investors away. Uh, so you need a long-term private equity manager who's been in the business for 35 years, who has the relationship with Index, who invested in their early funds, who gets kind of preferential treatment when they, when they raise. <coughs> Some of the top companies, I've deliberately selected this slide to show you that you haven't probably heard of any of these. Uh, and and that's, that's the point with this fund. These are the companies that you may well hear of in the next five years, if they IPO, if, uh, if you, you suddenly see adverts on the TV. Wayfair will be a, an example. You may, have, may just have seen adverts for Wayfair. It's a, a US online home goods retailer competing against Amazon, but only a specialist area of, of furnishings and, and kind of homeware. Uh, and they've really started to expand into Europe. You'll see them a lot more. Um, and so a lot of these are industrial businesses that frankly are maybe less glamorous than the names I mentioned earlier, but will deliver potentially strong returns. And then the exits, um, some, of the, some of the most famous exits we've made, these are the companies you probably have heard of because they've IPO'd, because they're high profile. They've, the money has been made, frankly, in, in, in many of these names. Um, Facebook, we made 300 times our cost at the HVP level on that investment. We were an early backer uh, via some of our underlying managers. Um, we backed Twitter, we backed Gro GoPro, which uh, IPO'd a couple of years ago. On the buyout side, Trainline and Autotrader, two UK deals, they were both more than four times money 
both 2006 and 7 deals, so pre-crisis, um, showing the, the, the ability of a private equity manager to drive value even from uh, a high purchase price level in, in 2006 and 7. And then, very quickly, because I'm, I'm running out of time, uh, China Hydroelectric at the bottom shows you the diversification in the portfolio. We, through a local Chinese M&A specialist, invested into a Chinese uh, hydroelectric power station business, um, which was sold within 18 months to Shenzhen Energy, another local player. Um, so that is the kind of reach that we have in the global portfolio. <clears throat> Costs, very quickly, I've included this because uh, I know that fees are a, a real focus uh, in, in the investment world these days, and we're completely transparent on this. Uh, private equity is an expensive asset class. Um, it's uh, very intensive in terms of the effort required to manage 6,900 companies at the, uh, the various levels. Um, and so this, this fund is much more expensive than an index track or a passive fund. Um, having said that, we have a very keen eye on costs. We, our fees are falling over time. Our direct expenses are coming down, as you can see from the chart. So we have a, a very clear focus on driving the costs as low as we can. <clears throat> and a summary slide, why invest in HVPE? So to, to kind of recap, you're, you're accessing an investment universe that is much larger than the listed space, much less efficient, so there's, there's much more value to be had. The returns historically are superior to the listed markets. Um, it's, it's still a relatively immature uh, investment class. Very, uh, there are people who still have not heard of private equity. Um, HVPE is arguably um, best place to profit from private equity returns. Uh, we have the, the best track record in the industry over the period since our inception. Um, we're one of the largest funds, one of those liquid funds. We have a diversified portfolio. We have a, a very skilled manager with 35 years experience. Um, and we're now a FTSE 250 company with all the governance and, and regulation that goes with that. So very transparent. Our annual report meets FTSE 250 guidance. And so you can be very confident that an investment in HVP puts you on a level playing field with some of these institutional holders that I've mentioned earlier. Um, and that the final line really should be the convincing one. We're trading at a 31% discount to the current portfolio value. We have a history over the last three years of achieving a 40% premium to book value when we sell our assets. So you have a 31% discount to the, to the book value. We're selling assets above that. So if you think about the buffer zone you have between where the shares are priced and where the assets actually are selling. Um, that could be an opportunity. And finally, I'll leave you with some press that we've been generating, trying to get the word out, trying to get HVPE um, better known in the investment universe, and, and hopefully that will help to, to close the discount as well. So. Richard, thank you very much indeed. That's terrific. Um, question here, please. Um, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that you showed a slide in which you showed that that fee had dropped from 2.8% to 2.3% mm -hmm. uh, from one year to the next. Yes. Can you explain why that, why that was mm -hmm. and whether that is a ratio that we can expect or a, a reduction that we can expect to continue mm -hmm. and why? Yep, thank you. Um, the fee drop in total from 2.7 to 2.3% uh, was primarily driven by the carried interest element. So that, that was the performance fee I mentioned. So. Um, the NAV growth last year was lower than it was in the previous year, so fewer of the funds were actually achieving that 8% IRR, so the, the performance fee was correspondingly reduced. Um, the direct expenses were actually slightly higher last year than they were the year before, so the carried interest more than offset that. Uh, the direct expenses last year were, were increased because we moved from the specialist fund segment of the London Stock Exchange to the main market, and there were fees um, charged for that. So that was an exceptional cost. So we see direct costs are likely to fall. Um, management fees, there's a clear trend downwards. If you look back from the IPO, we were paying more than 2% management fee to Harbourvest. We're now paying 1.1%. Um, and carried interest will vary from year to year. It's, it's somewhat unpredictable um, because of the, the individual fund performances. So I would say overall, the trend is certainly down. It's very hard to say where it'll be in two, three years, but likely to be lower than it is. 
Uh, and your, uh, if you look at a, a graph of your you know, share price, as you showed us earlier, yep. your, your flatline, or you have flatlined a bit, is there a particular reason for that in relation to the underlying investments? Um, um, or is it just uh, you know, investor aren't buying your shares? There's, there's a little bit of both. Um, the portfolio growth last year, as I say, was a little bit lower than it was in the prior year. And that will vary from year to year. It's, um, it's, it's a long-term uh, investment, frankly, and, and one year's performance is, is not really you know, uh, where we look to, to judge the fund. Um, but also, as I say, the discount has widened in the last year from, from 20% to 30%. So the share price has obviously not kept up with the NAV and the share price has been relatively flat. We, when we listed on the, the main market in London in September 2015, we were trading at £8.65, we're now at £9.20. So we have gained, but just not as much as the NAV would, would imply. So, um, so we think that, first of all, the NAV is conservative because, as I mentioned, we're selling assets at a 40% premium to, the, to that NAV. Um, and secondly, the shares haven't even kept up with that, <laughs> that conservative valuation. So, so that's why the, the share price over the last year or so has been fairly flat. Question in the back here, please. Um, I'd, be, I'd be interested to know, is there any um, gearing in the portfolio? Is there any borrowing? And also um, the actual capital structure? of Harbour Vest. Mm -hmm. um, is it just straightforward ordinary shares or are there different classes of shares? Mm -hmm. um, I'm harking back to the split capital right, yeah. problems. Yeah. Um, the, the, say the, the last question first, capital structure, it's all a single class of ordinary share. All shares have voting rights, there's no separate class of share at all, so everyone is on a level playing field. The Prudential who hold 8% have exactly the same rights per share as anybody else. Um, so, so that's an easy one to answer. The, the gearing point, HVP as an investment company actually has net cash. So um, we, we don't have structural gearing. It's not part of our strategy to have structural gearing. Uh, at the moment we have $169 million of cash with an investment portfolio of $1.2 billion. So um, I mean it's, it's a, a worthwhile point to mention that if you strip out the cash, the discount is even greater than it looks on the surface. Um, so, uh, so th that's a key point to make. The underlying private equity investments, however, will have leverage. Um, we took a sample of our buyout funds um, at the time of the annual report in January, and the average leverage rate was around four times EBITDA. So that's, that's how we measure these things in private equity. EBITDA is a measure of profit um, before you, you strip out various things. Um, and, uh, and the effectively translates into about 40% debt, 60% equity in those buyout companies. Um, but we also have growth capital and venture companies where you have very little, if any, debt. So if you average it out over the whole portfolio, it's probably around three times um, EBITDA, i.e. about 30% of, of, the, of the total enterprise value. So relatively low gearing in line with a typical listed uh, index fund. Hey, we've got a couple more questions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about your, your commitments and your, your funding for those? Yeah, sure. It's a good question because um, that is a key element in managing any closed-ended fund that you, clearly you're committing to future investments before the cash necessarily comes in. Um, so we, as a closed-ended fund, we're investing in long-term private equity funds. As I say, take 10 years to mature. So we need to commit to those funds ahead of time. Otherwise, all that would happen is our existing investments would be sold, we receive cash, and we build up cash on the balance sheet. So we need to commit before that cash comes in, otherwise we, we just build up too much cash. So at the moment, we have uh, just over $1.1 billion of forward commitments. Um, we typically see about 20% of that drawn every year, so around $200 million a year. We receive, at the moment, about 250 to $300 million in realizations every year. But in the, in the event that those realizations stop, which clearly they can do, um, we have the 169 million of cash. We also have a 500 million revolving credit line. So we have a total of nearly $700 million of liquid assets that we can use to fund those commitments in the short term. Um, but over time, there will always be some distributions. Even in the global financial crisis, we saw 7% of our portfolio turned over as cash 
um, in, in the year 2009, for example. Um, so we, we manage this very carefully. It's, it's a, a very scientific and very involved process, but we forecast over five years. We look at our um, performance over the last eight years since the IPO, but also Harbour Vest fund cash flows going back to the 1980s, early 1980s. So we have a very long-term data set to pull from when we forecast how much we should commit at any one time. We're going to take just one final question. Um, gentleman here, please. I was going to ask two, but <laughs> 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 one. hopefully one of them is very easy, yeah. which was, um, of your investments worldwide, how much is EU excluding the UK post-Brexit? Yep. Yep. And the other question, if I may, is who owns the manager that you, you pay this 2% to? Yep. Um, the investments in Europe as a whole are 21% of the portfolio value. The UK is just over 5%, so about 16% are EU, non-UK. Um, the management company that we pay the fees to is privately owned, so Harbourvest is not a listed company. This is a listed investment company that invests into Harbourvest funds, so two separate, two separate companies with similar names, which does cause confusion. Um, so yes, Harbourvest is completely privately owned, a Boston headquartered um, private equity manager. Okay. I think we're a little bit over time. That's been very interesting, Richard. Thank you yeah. very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.